quorum present now, so when you're ready, we'll get started. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we now have a quorum. I'll declare this meeting of the committee open. I advise that this special meeting of the committee will be streamed live on the City of Adelaide website, and a recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken, and it means that your contribution, your presence at, and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. The Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and we pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that, that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present. I have apologies from Councillor Ho and Councillor Sings. Um, that's all that I've received so far. Um, that takes us to three discussion forum items. Um, and I'll just flag. Sorry. Sorry, Councillor Abraham said he sent a message saying he's running late. Running late? Okay. Um, three discussion forum items. Now, as you're probably aware, uh, we're very lucky to have with us today our independent members of our audit committee for the City of Adelaide. Um, and that's so that we can have a really constructive deep dive um, regarding item, item 3, 1 and 3, 2, but also to set the scene for the context, the financial context. Um, in which we are operating. So I'll just pass to Mark before we pass to our independent or committee members. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Chair. This is a pretty important conversation tonight. And just as we've been providing um, over the last few months um, information, we continue to provide you with a clear picture of, of our financial position and both now and into the future. Um, tonight, we're really keen to receive any comments or views from you to guide our future financial outcomes. And I must be clear again that there are no decisions being made tonight and um, that will occur through a usual budget process. So it's a conversation and any information gathering approach tonight only. Um, in, um, in recent times, a lot has been said about Council's financial challenges as a capital city council, as I've mentioned, the same with a lot of other capital city councils. Um, and there's you know, no doubt that we're experiencing a financial impact like we've never really seen before. And um, the 2020 and 2021 financial year was always going to be challenging. We knew that. Um, and we've been faced with uncertainties and the impacts of COVID, particularly on our revenue side of our operating budget. Um, and we've needed to change the organisation to achieve necessary ongoing reductions. Um, in our operating cost base, and that's where the $20 million saving target has been being progressed. And for us, you know, like I said quite publicly, it's a culmination of a number of things, being seven years of keeping downward pressure on our rate increases, which is the zero rate and the dollar increases, while continuing to increase expenditure at the same time. We've had a sustained reduction in our revenues, which is our fees and charges have had downward pressure on as well. And, um, and also financial impacts of extensive rate rebates and the many, many currently unrated properties in the city um, combined with five years plus of, of quite ambitious infrastructure enhancements and key project and operation, operating initiatives sort of delivery. So, um, and then as I said, for, importantly COVID and its impacts on, on our business as a council. So consequently, it's becoming increasingly clear that we will experience a significant deficit I recognise that governments around the world, and Australia and South Australia, are going to be experiencing a deficit, but um, our deficit is going to be in the order of 40 to $50 million this financial year, which is material. Um, the deficit is really attributed to COVID and the sustained reduction in revenues over the past few years. And the combination of the above presents for us a very, very real financial challenge. And, one that needs to be appreciated, it needs to be considered, and it needs to be addressed by this council. Um, the return to financial sustainability, I think, is going to take uh, three to four years of sustained financial discipline uh, from both the administration and from council members. So it's going to be necessary for all the foreseeable future. Talk about discipline. That's discipline when we're making decisions both in setting the budget, as we're going to be doing over the next six months, and any decisions that we make outside of the budget cycle. Um, the long-term financial management plan um, 
will need to be reviewed and it must be based on a disciplined approach. And tonight we're going to be hearing from the independent members of our audit committee who we're going to provide you with their independent views on our financial position in the path forward. I think it's a really important thing to hear from them directly. We're then going to be discussing our rating policy, followed by our 2021-22 business plan and budget to really set the scene for the budget preparation process for the coming year. Um, can I just ask, I strongly urge you to, to avoid political issues tonight and really focus on the budget position uh, and the financial levers that we have and that we need to adjust. Um, need to get, we need as an administration to get from you some constructive discussion on how to work forward. So, I want to stress tonight is not a blame game, it's really just a financial position that we're in that we need to address. Um, and as I've said, the administration has been providing feedback for some time on our financial challenges and tonight, along with the advice from the independent audit committee members, um, we're going to review and consider potential changes to our rating policy as detailed in the papers and consider key aspects of next year's budget which we can then work on to deliver to you in our forward cycle of meetings. I need to be clear that from my perspective that as well as work we've done this year to reduce our costs, we need to take further decisive action to address our financial challenges. So what we've done to date has been positive and I think we've got more to do. Um, you know, no longer can we continue to erode our income. Um, no longer can we continue to commit funds over and above our budget and our financial capacity. We really need to recover to what is a surplus position over the next, next year and in future years. And um, to be clear, as an administration, uh, we, um, we're going to be recommending to you that we adopt a surplus approach rather than a deficit target for next year and the years after so that we can be sure that we are sustainable from a financial position. So that's the introduction I wanted to provide. It sets the context for what is a challenging time. And it is opportune because we have not only a challenge now, but a challenge into the very near future. And we are about to enter our budgeting process, but for tonight it will provide great insight into how we're going to manage that and how we're going to prepare the documentation for you to consider in the formal meetings of council in the coming coming year. So thanks, Chair, that's what I to say. Perhaps we can hear from you. Thank you. Um, yes, and so we have with us, of course, our Chair, David, David Powell. Um, we have as well Ross Haslam and Paula Davies. So over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, certainly welcome the opportunity to present to you today. Um, the independent members of the audit committee are attending today to provide comments to you in relation to the business plan and budget process for 21-22. Um, obviously, it's a startup process and we'd like to really contribute to that. Um, our independent members bring many decades uh, of financial, legal and risk experience. Um, and we've certainly got a strong affinity to local government. Um, all of us serve on multiple um, audit committees for local government. And we are particularly committed to a strong and thriving city of Adelaide. That's, um, that's our objective. Um, under our terms of reference, uh, our role is to report to council and to provide appropriate advice and recommendations on matters such as financial reporting, service planning and performance, risk, long-term financial planning and business plans. That's uh, the, in order to facilitate informed decision making in relation to discharging your legislative responsibilities and duties. So ultimately it's your um, discharging, but uh, it, we are looking to uh, contribute to the discussion. A number of factors have certainly contributed to the City of Adelaide's current financial position. Um, mentioned earlier, seven years of rate freezes resulting in a loss of rate income equivalent to $16 million over the period of CPI being applied. Um, continued project spending over the past three or four years, particularly on infrastructure, a, a big one in this last 12 months, uh, COVID-19 and a loss of other income, but only obviously parking and rent in the order of $20 million, uh, as well as providing support packages to impacted businesses. Um, there's a commitment to find $20 million in savings, uh, largely through um, redundancies, which will certainly impact on, on the development. Um, certainly, we've had concerns for a number of years in relation to the management of capital working capital working progress, and a large number of write-offs in recent years um, that have been significant. 
uh, and then importantly, uh, what was an operating surplus in 2016 and 17 of 17 million has been followed by deficits of 17 million in 17, 18, 21 million in, in 18, 19, 19 million in a deficit in uh, 2019-20, and as Mark just mentioned, the forecast in the order of $40 million deficit in 2021. So um, that's a, a long history of, of deficits um, where now um, our key indicators um, suggest we should be only for surplus. Um, and also importantly, a long-term financial plan uh, with many key indicators in uh, showing as amber and red in near years, so in very many years. And we've also got limited confidence in later years um, when you apply current assumptions and some of the future requirements for maintenance on infrastructure such as bridges and stormwaters of quite significant speed there. Um, the view of the uh, independent members is to continue like this is not financially sustainable. Um, and is a major financial and reputational risk to council uh, and in the worst case um, could find you not financially viable. The Local Government Act um, at Section 8K requires the council to uphold and promote the principle to ensure the sustainability of the council's long-term financial performance and position. Um, so uh, based on that requirement, uh, we, we do highly recommend um, that elected members consider the following when it comes to um, your process tonight as you start the planning process. Um, sorry. Uh, we, we certainly um, recommend that you adopt a surplus funding model uh, or break even at worst um, because future surpluses are needed to repay debt. Uh, and obviously surpluses are in accordance with your long-term financial plan KPI targets. We also suggest that any new projects, initiatives and programs should be full, uh, fully fundable funded through the revenue that they generated or through uh, other saving opportunities you might have um, through reduced service levels. And um, any decisions on new projects too, uh, initiatives and programs uh, should have appropriate cost-benefit analysis including considering any, any revenue that's generated, um, showing how they align with strategic priorities um, prior to approval and can demonstrate how they'll be funded through use of credential reports as appropriate. So that's a, a starting point for me. Um, I think Ross and Paul will add some extra comments. Uh, first of all, I totally agree with David's thoughts and comments, except when he looked at me and talked about decades. I didn't really agree. <laughs> so, as a CEO of that rate payer, I know that our rates can be a favourably low metric. You just need to turn on your mic. Sorry, thank you. Just, just say again. Uh, I totally support David's thoughts and comments. As a city of Adelaide rate payer, I know that our rates can be a favourably with the, compared to other metropolitan councils. I like the idea of quantifying rate increases, for instance, 2.95 or 5%, 5.9% equals $100 or $200. That is, uh, it's equivalent to one less cup of coffee every two weeks. I can do that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's not a big task. So, uh, as I said, uh, I don't want to say too much more, but basically I support what David said and uh, um, I think it's a good opportunity to give a word to you. Thank you. Um, I also support uh, David's sentiments. Um, we've uh, obviously had concerns and it's a great opportunity to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, I want to stress the, the due diligence approach, I suppose, which is that last aspect uh, in the recommendations in terms of, you know, you have a budget, you have a strategic plan, you know, it's really important that you align with that. And when you're departing, you know, that it be very mindful of the implications. Now, um, that, that seems um, fairly straightforward, I think, but in the current environment, obviously there are pressures from various sources. And it's just really, um, I'd like to remind, you know, that that's, really an important basic starting premise for decision making. Um, you'll make 
much better decisions and have much um, uh, greater success in terms of achieving your long-term objectives if you do so. Thank you. Um, Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. We, we're we planning just to stay for a few questions now and then we're going to sort of head to the back so we're not you know, taking over the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do have any other questions, that's fine too. Um, to you, back Excellent. to the Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, Ross and Paula. Um, yeah, so we'll do uh, perhaps five minutes or so um, uh, of questions if members have them, um, just because this is a very good opportunity. And then um, I've also invited the audit committee if if there's anything burning that they wish to add throughout any point while they're here in the course of the evening um, to help our constructive deliberations and discussion um, that they're welcome to uh, as well. So they've got that opportunity. But uh, we'll go to questions if members have them. Uh, yeah, look, um, uh, I noted in your last um, audit committee minutes that you talked about the financial imprudent, those are the words, are they financially imprudent to deviate in any way from the current budget? Yes. Yeah, the, I mean, I understand financial imprudence, but what were you saying if you spend another $100 or $2 million or $10 million or any amount, that would be a financially imprudent thing to do? Outside of the budget, I'm not sure that it's necessarily you know a hundred dollars, Philip. But I think it's more to do with um, you've got a, a budget that you're working with, and and um, what we need to be doing is is um, being, I think we need to be particularly focused on um, living within our means. I think for the next period of time, uh, and. Um, and we can't sustain, I, I, I think it's not possible to sustain the kind of uh, deficits you're having year on year for four years in a row. I mean, that, that quick sum was $100 million in the last four years is, um, of deficits is, um, is, is not, not a good story. Yep. Uh, and I think you, you couldn't continue like that. Um, it's an opportunity for you to set, stand back now and say, okay, um, I appreciate this. It's a very tough times, and no one was expecting COVID, and no one suggested that that's a decision of council. But um, we do; it, it has been, the, I think, the ultimate trigger for us to really stand back and go, "This is not sustainable," and this, and it just showed how vulnerable we can be if you know to, to these kind of events. And I think where, where we've got to go from here is to be going, "What have, what do we need to do now to?" To, to turn this around so that we can increase revenues, um, manage our costs, create surpluses, um, create a fund, you know, to be able to fund future spend, pay down debt, all those things that need to be done over time. And, and uh, just following that up, Jim, so, so what you're saying to us is that it's a suite of actions that are required, yes. managing costs, but as well looking at revenue increase. It, it's, there's only there's only a few levers really. Um, there's revenue, which is is either rates or other income, um, you know, from from other services, parking, rent, all the other services you provide, user charges. Um, so ways to increase your revenue um, you know, initiatives where you do spend, look for opportunities that actually create revenue generation rather than just cost more cost. Uh, and then in terms of the cost side of things, um, be really clear about you know, what the basis for the spend is going forward. Um, and and you know, one of the challenges and, and that we perhaps haven't had necessarily is um, good asset management plans that start to show where some of those future spends are going to be needed. And there's some things that are not particularly sexy in the future spending, like spending on bridges or on, um, on stormwater infrastructure, which is below the ground and doesn't really, you know, it's not very impressive, but it, it, they're things that need to be spent on going forward. And so it'll be interesting to see as our asset management plans become more, um, I guess, uh, clear uh, on where those future spends are going to be. And I think we need to be really listening to um, what that looks like going forward, but it's, it, there's going to be a lot of financial demands coming forward, I, I think. And you're not coming from a strong base. I guess that's really what I'm saying. 
And you quantified the difference between the freeze in the rate in the dollar yeah. and applying a CPI at $16 million over the last seven uh, years. Uh, yeah, it's a cumulative 16, not 16 per year. No, I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what is the calculation of the cumulative increase in rates through uplift in valuation? Because that's the other key part of rate income that yeah. it, it rises with property value increases. Have you been able to quantify that? Is it similar? Um, I haven't attempted to do that, but my understanding is that that um, uh, obviously you've frozen the rate in the dollar, which I appreciate that rate as opposed to you know, zero percent increase, um, zero increase. But you, um, I think the differential. I think I believe that sixteen million dollars is the cumulative over if you'd actually increased the rate in the dollar by CPI, so that it, um, over and above the valuation amount. That's my understanding. Is that, I don't know if someone can, I think I'm yeah. getting a few nods around the table. Um, so, so if you had increased your um, rate in the dollar by CPI each year over that period, you would have earned $16 million more income revenue over that seven year period. So, you know, it, 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 it's significant. I mean, it is one of your, it's one of your key sources of income, clearly rates um, about, I think about half of your revenue comes from rates off the top of my head, mm -hmm. roughly 50%. The rest comes from you know, other parking and commercial activities and rent. Thank you. We'll just go to Anne. Uh, yeah, just on that, um, I mean, I will always like to freeze rate a dollar. Um, our financial situation hasn't been caused by COVID. We were in bad financial state before COVID. Um, and I don't think really much has changed for us. We've been running at a loss of, I think, $400,000 a week for about four years now. Um, so COVID's just a smokescreen. Now, I think the figure that Phil wanted uh, to quantify is very important because the reason I'm happy to freeze the rate in the dollar is because Adelaide has been developing well and increasing its um, urban population. And we have relied on the uplift of rates caused by increased rating, a rating of properties. And 16 million cumulative really isn't a lot in the whole scheme of things. So could, could you get that figure to us? How much our rates have increased because of um, uplifting property values? Well, and and more. So sorry, and that's that's more of a that's more of a request that we direct to, to no, Claire. I don't know. Sorry. There's too many microphones on. What's your mic? Um, thank you. So our long-term financial plan, Councillor um, Councillor Martin, does um, factor in new development, um, and I think that's around one and a half percent, which is roughly equates to one and a half million dollars a year. A year. Uh, uh, may I just uh, put a clarity in regard to that? Uh, 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 when I joined this council, I believe that our annual rate revenue was at the order of 93 million, and we're talking in these documents of 112, is it? 112. So that's a greater increase. Uh, but I'd be very grateful if you could come back with this to us with a comparison. Absolutely. Some years it's fluctuated, I think between around two and a half percent, maybe. Yeah, so it usually equates roughly the percentage to the dollar equivalent, but um, we do have the budget session um, coming up as well, so we can provide um, oh, hopefully yeah, more detail. That. Thank, you. Thank you. Then Mr. France. Um, in, in this, is there any, uh, we have, is there any guess uh, about how uh, the value, you know, the property values are going to perform, obviously, with all of the, the negative uh, impacts that we have from COVID? Is there any thoughts around what, that, how will that impact upon uh, the actual, you know, values of the properties we have in town? Because obviously that determines then, you know, one of the million that may or may not exist. Um, it's not something I've studied, but I believe it would be considered in the budget presentation today, so is that correct? Um, yes, absolutely. So, Councillor Knob, um, the property valuations are obviously assessed um, regularly um, because of COVID. We're taking a much more um, purposeful approach to keeping an eye on those valuations. Um, uh, the, obviously, the value of general um, sets of valuations for um, everyone else. Uh, we set our own. Um, we do have Teresa, our head of property valuations, um, sitting with Sonja shortly to work you through the rating policy. And I'm sure Teresa will be able to perhaps provide a bit more insight shortly. 
Any further questions? Um, just a quick one from John May. Um, uh, you touched on asset management plans and mm. um, and what have you. It's a very very important component of our budget. Um, uh, do does do you have a view on uh, the quantum of carry forwards, particularly from capital expenditure on infrastructure that happens each year at the City of Adelaide? <coughs> I wouldn't actually know the numbers off the top of my head. I mean, um, projects do carry forward. Um, there are projects that go for more than one year, for example. Uh, there are projects that are delayed for various reasons. Um, obviously, um, Capital programs are often ambitious and not necessarily well spent, so that you get carry forwards as a result of that. Um, in terms of the asset management planning side of it, I think um, we, we're getting better at it, particularly around our condition assessment now, uh, around what the state of our current assets. And you know, the fact is, we've got aging infrastructure. It's not we're not a brand new city, um, so we are going to have that, have that situation. So. Um, <coughs> will start to drive what future expansion needs are going to be um, and they are, they're, they're costs that you need to consider in terms of the percentage of spend in terms of coverage of that. I mean you've got you've got again KPIs or key performance indicators or, or ratios on, um, on appropriate spend in relation to that capital um, and plan, mm. asset management plan. Mm. Um, so it would be important for you to be matching your spending to to to, to deal with those ratios. Um, if you're not spending the hundred percent of what you need to spend, you, your assets continue to deteriorate. So mm. um, that's a fact. Uh, and you can't afford to spend 150% of that because you should be spending that on something else. So yeah. it's getting that that aspect of it right. Yeah, and and is it? And forgive me, I'm not aware of any other audit committees or particular local government areas that you may be on. But um, uh, is it is it the case that if you don't deliver your full works program, you know these works are timed, as I understand it, uh, in order to make sure you're uh, spending your money as efficiently as and effectively as possible. If the infrastructure further degrades, you may be spending more on it down the track. Mm -hmm. So if you have a substantial, is it fair to say that if you have a substantial amount of carry forwards, you're then possibly spending more on your infrastructure in the long run because you're unable to deliver your work? It's possible that it might be inefficient uh, if you're starting to stop in projects. Um, not necessarily indicating that's what the case is. And, and, and at the moment, there's still the industry, the civil industry is such that they are pretty keen for work. So it may not, you know, might not be seeing significant increases, you know, year on year on what it might cost you to, to do these projects. I think it's more to do with the, the challenge of the, the quantum and, and the, the biggest problem you have. I like to call it a bow wave. Um, if you don't spend the money you need to spend on your assets, eventually it's going to come home to roost because you're going to have a year that you can't jump over. Yeah. Like if you keep saying, well, we're not going to spend that, you know, it's telling us to spend 40 million and we're only going to spend 20, then year eight is going to have a cost of $120 million and you'll be going, where's that going to come from? Because we, we're, we, you know, the bridge has failed or the, or, or our debt level is such that we don't have capacity to borrow to you know, deal with that, or we keep putting pressure on the infrastructure. Yeah. So that's one of the really important factor when you're looking at your asset management planning and your long-term financial planning, that you consider what those future years look like. Because mm -hmm. um, it's not as simple as just looking at next year's budget. Yeah, yeah. And I'm conscious, sorry, I'm conscious that was from a more of a risk perspective and drawing yeah. other experience, but if Clinton, if you could, if you could we have any information. Sorry, the chairman, in, in January, February this, this year coming up, we're going to be workshopping in detail a strategic asset management plan. So we're going to go into a real, um, real close uh, deep dive into all the aspects of uh, how we're going to approach our assets in the future. So. Okay. I think that's pretty much right, Clinton. Yes. The time frame, January, February next year. Yeah. And just just one just one final one. Sorry. Um, uh, is it is it is, would it be fair to say that a lack of a thorough and comprehensive asset management plans across everything that we take care of has meant that we're in a sense to a degree flying blind as to what what upcoming big ticket items maybe maybe out there. Obviously, we can list off. A whole bunch of them, yeah. but some have some have haven't been dealt with. Take the bridge, the aquatic centre, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I think I suspect that might be true. I mean, I can't say with absolute confidence that you, you haven't been aware of 
everything, but I think there are some big tick, tick items that are coming up. And you just mentioned a few, you know, bridges or aquatic centers are good examples. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, okay, no, understood. Um, I had Phil, but I'll go to you after the Lord Mayor, just because we've had your go already. Sandy? Um, I think that, um, as you said, we, we do know and they figure in a long-term financial plan um, and Bridge is probably a, a classic one, which we know and we've actually had those discussions with the teams in terms of uh, where it's up to as an asset. Um, in the work that you've done uh, with various councils, have any councils set up sinking funds for major infrastructure work such as that? I mean, the bridge is around $60 million mark from memory. So, um, you know, and, and that features in the long-term financial plan, I think in about 10 years' time, Claire, is that about? You might be in year 11, yeah. so you're not on the So, so um, I know we did see it right at the end of one of the long-term financial plans that we saw. So is that, is that something that a council would normally do? Um, I have seen councils establish, um, a couple that I've been involved with um, have established uh, a, a capital fund uh, where they actually did an additional rate, clearly in the order of one and a half percent, where they specifically called, you know, rated for a capital fund uh, for future projects um, that seem to work quite well. Um, I'm not sure that's necessarily anything we've done here before, but um, I think it, what I liked about it was that you could actually mark the, the funds uh, that you've collected through your rates specifically for projects, uh, and, and obviously uh, residents or ratepayers will understand the value of that as well. Yes, I think it's quite well done. And what you were describing around um, sort of the investment and in assets goes back even a couple of terms, and you remember in 2010, I think it was 2010, 2011, when we went from 20 million up to 35 million in terms of was that bridge, infrastructure. No, that was just that um, uh, we needed to um, increase the asset base, and then it went up to around 40, I think, from there. So, um, um, which was just a, a back pile of um, a backlog of assets so that, that needed to That wave is a dangerous. It's you know we talk about. COVID second waves, mm -hmm. or you kind of don't want a, a bow wave um, yeah, coming right. forward in terms of in your long-term financial plan that you can't yeah. can't fund. And and the other one, of course, is um, in particularly in this year where we know that we're going to have further losses around COVID, and uh, we're not quite sure where we're going to end up yet in terms of uh, the operating deficit. Um, you're suggesting that there be a, a business case or a cost benefit analysis for anything that comes into council for approval for a, for major expenditure. I do. I mean, I think you should be able to justify the basis for a future spend. Uh, I mean, I, as I indicated before, I mean, the kinds of projects you might be willing to look at are things that generate revenue, means that helps yeah. with the other lever, um, and also um, that you actually can. And justify the benefit of why you're doing the spend on any project. I mean, I think that's just sound yeah. business process that you see yeah. anywhere. Yeah. And members, we have had several of these discussions in audit, and um, I invite you all to join us for, for audit if you are able to, because they are really great discussions around budget and what uh, future spending is looking like. So, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Jim. Okay, and I'm conscious we're eating into the rest of the workshops, but oh, yeah, I've no. allowed more time because it is incredible. Yeah, no, so yeah, just so you quickly, yeah. thank you for the invitation, to Lord Mayor. I did used to go. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, if, I can, if I can ask a question uh, in relation to the Bowway, using that uh, analogy again, uh, the long term financial plan, which is approved by this council as part of the budget process, has put a bow wave of $127 million in 10 years from now. Are you saying we should be careful about that? Um, yes, I think, I mean, I think the reality is um, uh, you, you are charged under the Act to actually consider your long-term financial plan. And yep. um, you, it, it's not as simple as just thinking about next year's budget. I mean, you do need to be considering how we're going to fund our future spend and um, conscious that like you know at the moment debt appears to be very cheap i don't know what the situation is going to be in five or ten years time i can't predict that i'm not very good at predicting that but 
I can say that you know if you if you're starting to hit your debt limits and you're going how are we going to fund in the future, you can't just put your rates up 100 mm percent, -hmm. or you can't increase the car parking by 100 percent or something, you know, to, to try and deal with it. So that it's the decisions you make today and the surpluses that you actually start to aim to achieve and actually achieve gives you the capacity to start to pay down debt. So you're in a position to deal with those those major spends coming forward. And so it, it's not as simple as next year, it's the net, considering the next can bridge. Yep, thank um, you. And, and it might be that that bridge is an anomaly, but if it's in year 11 and there is 120, whatever the number is, yep. then it's, um, that's the need to have considered it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any quick burning questions? No. Then we'll go ahead to the back. All right. Um, Fantastic. Thank you. I probably should say that. I'll let you discuss it. All right. So we'll move on in earnest to 3 1, which is the workshop on the rating policy or our rating policy. And we've got Sonjoy and Teresa. And Yep, and Claire will give us up. Thank you. So thank you, uh, members. So the rating policy policy was last formally reviewed um, in the previous term of council back in 2015, and obviously much has changed in that time. Um, in 2017, uh, former council uh, members will remember the comprehensive review of our rating policy that was undertaken by John Comrie, who um, we were really fortunate to be able to engage. Um, so John is a leading financial and rating specialist here in Adelaide, he's done work across, um, across the nation. Um, and so we've attached that tonight, and if you didn't get a chance to read it, um, I really encourage you to have a look. Um, he provided a range of recommendations within that paper back in 2017, some of which were testing with you tonight. Um, the materials have been designed to give you a really comprehensive overview of our rating principles, the methodology, the exemptions and rebates in particular. And we've also shared some hypothetical scenarios. So just to be really clear, this isn't about this isn't about poking a bear tonight. It really is just saying, well, if you want to look at a separate rate levy for a particular infrastructure, what could that look like? And it's just asking council members to really consider um, a bit more sort of broadly around how um, the current ratepayers of the City of Adelaide um, understand and pay for the services um, and infrastructure um, that they're seeking from the council. So we have Sonjoy, Liz and Teresa here tonight to work you through it. Um, ideally, we wouldn't be spending a lot of time on some of the slides, but it is quite a complex um, a subject, so um, I um, ask that you um, work with the team just to um, make sure that you understand any questions, please feel free just to keep asking as we go along, otherwise I'll hand over uh, to Sanjoy to work you through this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the words, Claire. Um, just wanted to flip through the uh, the workshop and and just want to highlight on this page is the link to the John Connery presentation of the workshop. So if you did want to take a look at that, that'll take you directly to um, to that report. Um, the the workshop will cover a few things. One's around this just the general high level principles of how we're rating, uh, and then we'll just go through and just quickly cover what our current rating base is. Uh, and then really around uh, providing the clarity around what the rate income looks like, our exemption, exemptions and rebates and remissions, and then some other scenarios that you could look at around uh, some of the levers that we could pull. Um, the four key questions that we're going to be asking is around, you know, council's views on the special discretionary rebate, um, your views around separate, rebate, uh, separate rates, uh, how we want to work through potentially vacant land and obviously then some discounts uh, to ratepayers as well. Um, I guess just, just to cover a bit of the principles of why and how we're rating, it's really around five key things, which is around the, the benefits received uh, from by the ratepayers, the capacity to pay by our ratepayers, uh, the administrative simplicity and how we manage and apply uh, our rates and how we collect those rates. And then obviously the economic uh, efficiency about those rates so that it um, uh, doesn't distort any kind of uh, economic behaviors. And obviously the policy consistency so that we ensure it's transparent, uh, predictable, equitable across all rate payers. 
Um, just to really high level the valuation methodology. So there's typically three ways um, that councils can uh, can get their valuations and rates, which is around capital value, uh, site value, and then an annual assessed value. City of Adelaide has uh, for many years used the annual assessed value. Um, and because we've got such a, our, our rate base is, such, is quite high around the business uh, rates and, and we've got a lot of information around uh, or market data around that. So it's, it's actually uh, allows us to do really good competitive uh, analysis on that valuation process and not necessarily just tying it to a capital value. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor raised a motion on notice a little while ago around how we create, how we actually uh, value uh, development sites. I just want to just quickly show, uh, which wasn't in the right in the pack that went out, but I just wanted to give this an example, uh, which is just a hypothetical example. So if there is a commercial office building um, that's six level tower and it was at fifty percent complete, how we would then value that is take the land value. Uh, of, of that location, uh, which in this example would say it's a million dollars. And then we look at the percentage uh, complete of the construction, which is based on what their initial development application uh, that they submitted, um, which would then give us uh, a cons construction cost. And then we add those two together, which in this example is $1.4 million. We then take a 5% of that value, uh, which is then $70,000, and that's the, the valuation that we look at, and then we apply the rate on the dollar on that valuation, which then gets us our rates. So that's typically how we handle um, all the construction or development sites, uh, whereas all the sites that are already built goes through an annual assessed value, which is based on um, lease rates and stuff like that. Just in general, really quick high, high overview. So we go through and actually uh, value all of our property, uh, both residential and non-residential. Um, and we put a valuation around that, which is uh, in the order of about $1.56 million in valuations across uh, across those properties. We then look at what properties are then exempt, so we actually subtract that out. Um, so we've uh, so we've got about 516 properties that are actually exempt, and that's typically through legislation, either um, state or commonwealth legislation. Um, so that's basically $35 million is foregone revenue for us because of these uh, exemptions. Um, we then apply some of the, uh, the rebates, and some of these rebates are actually also uh, legislated as, as well. So things like the zoo and stuff like that, I'll go through new deals. So that's, once again, another $5.9 million of, um, uh, of rates that we forego. And then obviously we've also got some special discount rebates that we apply as well. Uh, oh sorry, special discretionary rebates. Uh, and that's really allowing to just manage uh, the ups and downs of valuations and just kind of level that out. And that's around $1.3 million uh, in, in foregone revenue. So that basically ends up leaving us uh, in the 2021 year of one point, oh, sorry, $113 million in raised revenue. So if you look at it, out of the whole, of all the properties uh, that's in the city of Adelaide, it's actually only 72.6% of all of our properties that we actually get our rate income from. So just some quickly high, uh, some examples of those that are actually exempt uh, through uh, the local government act. So Crown Land, uh, University Recreation Grounds, Council owned land as well, so the land that the city of Adelaide owns. Emergency services, and if there are any other act um, that might apply, so it's a bit of a process for us to go through all of these little acts and pick out which or which ones apply exemptions. But that works out to be about twenty-seven point four percent of all uh, rate income that we forfeit. Uh, just to give quick numbers, uh, I won't go through any of these details, but this is just a broken that down by the different exemption types and what we're uh, foregoing. Uh, I think the important thing to also uh, look at that is if you look at City of Adelaide versus the City of Melbourne around the exemptions, so City of Melbourne uh, exemption is only about 12.2% of their rate base, where ours is 22.7. So you can see that there's actually a significant amount of uh, properties that we are currently exempted compared to other uh, City of Melbourne, for example. Mm. Yeah, I, I will. I will stop very briefly for questions. If yeah, if uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Sandra. Uh, in terms of that comparison with Melbourne and Adelaide, my, would I be right to assume that it's not that we have more classes of exemption 
existing in South Australia, but more a function that the commercial sector of the city of Melbourne's economy is just that much larger, and therefore the relativities, of the percentages can be, can be a little bit oh, yeah, yeah, that was about to ask the same. Have you compared, I think as well, just going on, as the classes of exemptions, are they largely the same or are they? In, in general, they would be the same, but there may be some specific in the actual Victorian legislation that we haven't, that we haven't matched up to be honest, but the general, a lot of them are a commonwealth, uh, like crown land, uh, which would be the same concept across both states. Uh, I think it's probably fair to also say that City of Melbourne may not have as many properties in there's a core CBD that's actually exempt as compared to City of Adelaide. So if you look at you know the universities and stuff like that and, you, and we've got some, some, some maps in there that can show how universities for example have actually expanded out uh, out of the North Terrace which because of the default of their universities, we actually have to then now consent them as well. So I, I know this, the, uh, the Victorian local government have um, put in submissions to state government to their state government around exemptions for universities, and uh, we've done the same. Or our local government association has done the same as well around looking at how universities are exempt and if there's things that we can do around that. But it's currently it's they're exempt. Okay. Thank you. As I was mentioned, so here's an example. Uh, so in, in 2008 and 2009, so uh, the two, so this is just university, uh, and this is their, I guess, more or less their footprint uh, that is currently exempt. Okay, so that's in 2008 and 2009. If you look at 2018 and 2019, and you compare, you can really see that Uni, Uni SA has probably expanded quite a bit uh, compared to uh, Uni Adelaide. And then we've also gotten uh, Flinders Universities come in as well. So you can see that there is a substantial area uh, that's been taken by the universities, which uh, has resulted in some exemptions. Oops. Um, not as pretty as the other maps, but this is just an example of taking, if you look at all the other uh, exemption types that we've listed previously, this is the overlay of that around uh, this. So this is the core CBD. Uh, and this just shows the number of uh, properties and sites that are actually exempt from rates. Uh, so that's a combination of council owned or, or crown owned or a combination of other things as well. And sorry, Sanjay. Yes. Um, oh, no, you were just about to go to the riverbank. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, this one's really a bit hard to see, but this, this is the riverbank. Um, so you would see the big blue on uh, your right, uh, or my right, your yeah, maybe you should be your right as well. Uh, which, is the, which is the zoo, <laughs> which is which is the zoo, uh, the uh, zoological area. So that's actually uh, exempt uh, from uh, from rates, from taxes. Uh, the yellow stripey is uh, Uni Adelaide, in essence. Um, the blue is uh, Crown, which is either uh, state government or uh, mainly state government. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the yellow is under the Recreational Grounds Act, so Adelaide Oval um, is the darker yellow, uh, and then the uh, lighter yellow is once again Instrument of Crown, which is for public public purposes. And sorry, just yeah, yeah, just on that. So looking looking at this, uh, looking at North, the intersection of North Terrace and King William. You've got Crown unalienated land that is obviously Parliament House, and so immediately behind that, Festival Plaza, Lang Walker's building, that's not rateable. I'm assuming. Looking at looking at this mm. map, is that it? Yeah. So yeah. So I believe it's not rateable. Not rateable. No. Wow. Okay. Not yet, or until the development's complete. No, I think not at all. Right. Right. Yeah. So the, yeah, so the uh, the Walker Corp, um, so the Walker Corp around that is which is around the festival center, where the foregone revenue is about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow. Uh, so the other thing, uh, which um, just to highlight, if you look at the new um, Sky City Casino development, uh, currently that's actually not rated as well, just for the fact that it's still sitting on Crown land and the Crown has, hasn't actually handed it over to Sky City. So as soon as they hand over to Sky City uh, the land, then it becomes rateable. But until they do that, it's not rateable. So, and because it's for a public purpose and Sky City is, is a business, it's not necessarily for a public purpose. So 
Yes. Yeah, well, that's that's what I'm thinking. Have we have we had any comprehensive legal advice or tested that in any sort of fashion recently? Uh, not from a legal advice perspective, but I think because my understanding is because the title still sits, the land title still, still sits uh, with the crown, it's it's exempt. So once the title gets transferred over to Sky City, we can then look at rating it. That's my understanding. But happy to take out a legal opinion on it. Yeah. No, yeah. We'll leave that one. Yeah. No, sorry. No, that's right. Through the chair. Look, I might just chip in there. I think it is a very important piece of work because there are other other properties within the river bank that are applied equally in the same way. So as a council, we need to be really on top of the advice we get and apply it wherever we can because there are other developments that are happening which could easily escape being measured as well. Well, honestly, so, sorry, a statutory well, interpretation it comes down to what is a public purpose. So that's what needs to be defined, tested, and, and if we disagree with the challenge, yeah. to be honest. Anyway, sorry. That's okay. Um, and this is just a, a snapshot of what uh, North Adelaide looks at as well from an exemption perspective. So the majority of that is, is probably council land. Um, and then we've got um, a few crown land in there as well. Uh, so just going through uh, rebates. So rebates are part of the local government act um, and they really cover things around health services, community services, religious purposes, uh, cemeteries, the, the zoological society, education, and then the discretionary rebate. So the discretionary rebate is up to council, and that's where we actually fit the the five year free rate scheme that we that we have done, which is coming to an end. Uh, that so that's uh, under the discretionary rebate. Uh, from uh, from a dollars perspective, so we are looking at about close to six million dollars in foregone uh, rates income in that space. But really, the majority of that is, is actually legislated by, by the Act. So there's not much other than really the, if you look at the self-funded uh, retirees and if you look at the remissions for pensioners, so that's something that we could actually look at. Um, and then the discretionary rate. So those, uh, the discretionary rate, uh, a rebate above, is really around, so for example, a community service by legislators is 75% rebates. Depending on a on an as on an individual basis, that could go up to 100% to rebate. So that kind of just fits within that discretionary area. But um, under the the remissions for self funded retirees and pensioners, that is an opportunity that you you may want to consider. Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's all over discussions. <laughs> it's a workshop. <laughs> Uh, so this is the special discretionary rebate. So this is that 10% uh, that we apply just to help level out some of the rapid changes in valuations uh, or any other anomalies that we may, that the rate payer may get in their property through the valuation processes. Um, and that yeah, does fluctuate uh, year on year. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just, just on that, is do, do you have like a, an, an average or a median figure as to what those, what those come in at? So how, what those percentage increase? So if, if you're only going to apply 10%, but was the revaluation? Is it an average of 15%, 17%? What's the? Uh, to, 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 yeah, to, yeah. To so you do. Five. I'm assuming you do 10% yeah. this year and then 7% the following year, for example. I um, that to Teresa to. That's for the general valuations. So just to clarify the question. Yes. Yes. It just it, it is an overall um, look at the market as a whole. Um, so I wouldn't have a percentage because obviously it does fluctuate in line with, with market yeah. and depending on what's happening. Yeah, so it really varies. It does vary. Okay. Um, so something to consider around the special discretionary rebate is currently we apply that 10% uh, rebate to both residential and non-residential um, uh, properties. And so that's something so some opportunities you could look at there is around, um, sorry, not keeping track of my words. Um, so, you know, one, one thing, one option you could consider is just leaving the 10% the for both residential and non-residential. Um, you could consider uh, increasing the discretion rebate to 15% uh, for both residential and non-residential. And what that would look like if, that is something you do want to consider is about an increase of about two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars in our um, rate income uh, if you if we increase from ten to fifteen. 
Um, if you just look at that 50 and only apply that just to residential and, and leave non-residential properties out, um, the increase is actually $1.28 million um, in there. Or if you look at the current 10% uh, discretionary rate rebate and you just only apply to residential owner occupiers, um, that will uh, have an increase to our rate, ba uh, rate income by about $1.28 million. So that's something to consider. Uh, so then the, the separate rate, uh, so in, in the Act it does allow us to uh, apply to create a separate rate for consideration for council, for council purposes. Obviously we do that right now with the uh, with Rundle Mall, uh, with the Rundle Mall levy and the regional landscape uh, levy as well with the NRM levy. So we do currently do that at the moment. Um, but as um, uh, David uh, and Ross and, and Paul did here, we could consider some other opportunities around using special rates uh, to create sort of that income fund. And I just throw this out as an example around. So if we say, for example, look at the Southwest Community Center as just an example, uh, you know, we look at a target of trying to raise $1.5 million so that we can look at purchasing the Southwest Community Center. If we want the time frame we want to raise, that is in one year. Uh, because we want to uh, buy that property within that year. And if we look at it, uh, applying that levy just to the South Ward assessment. So it's not the whole city, it's just to that area uh, that are the main beneficiaries, you could, I guess you could say, of, of that area, of, the, of that community center. So if you apply that to both residential and commercials, uh, that would work out to be for residentials, um, a increase to their to to their rate for one year of one hundred fifty seven dollars, and for commercial I should I just said non uh, non residential commercial uh, four hundred and forty two uh, dollars on their rate for that one year. So if we increase that just for that area for one year, we would we would be able to raise one point five million dollars to purchase a Southwest Community Center, as an example. Yeah, I I am familiar with it. Of that concept, and it's a curious thing. Um, some rate players have already raised this issue uh, as a consequence of your sure, paper. Sure. And, and the question that they ask, and uh, I don't know, there may be experience elsewhere. If you start that practice, how do you deal with multiple needs? So, you know, the Southwest Pays for the Community Centre, suddenly we want to do an aquatic centre, that's mm. another 200. Yeah. Then we have a green levy, yeah. and that's another 100. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Do you say one levy or? Yeah, it, it's it's it is a difficult to, to look at and applying all of those potential levies across all the rates. I mean, it is if this is something that we if we, if council does want to actually consider, we could actually do some modeling around that. So if we look at say actually do want you know if we were to consider a separate rate for Southwest and NRM and potentially run the mall and all that, what could that look like uh, for a rate payer? We could model that for you and come back and say that this is what that would look like uh, for consideration. I, I don't have the actual, and I'm not 100% sure how we do that, but you can model that. So, so that's so that's just, a, just an example, just for how you just create a special rate for one area of council, and then we can apply that across different uh, area lenses. Once again, if you look at the aquatic center, for example, if we were to look at raising $20 million uh, in uh, for the aquatic uh, center for redevelopment, then you may want to raise that over two years. Uh, instead of one year, uh, and we'd apply that against all assessments so that the whole City of Adelaide uh, assessments uh, would contribute. Uh, residentials would be looking at, uh, at $173 uh, per year for two years, increased their rates, and then uh, non-residential would be looking at uh, a $709 uh, increase to their rates for those two years on top of what they would normally pay in the normal rates assessments. Once again, just, just proof of thought. Uh, vacant land, so I, th I think we've had, had a few conversations around vacant land uh, historically. Um, and once again, it's just to get some feedback on, from you around how we want to look at um, doing a, a separate rate uh, for vacant land so that we can help, I guess, either promote uh, landowners to develop or disincentivize uh, land banking in those areas. So. Uh, currently, we've got about 40 properties that are currently uh, rated as, as vacant. Uh, 29 of those properties are, as we can tell, un undeveloped for a period of more than five years. 
So one of the, so a couple of things, options that we could consider is to declare special differential vacant land rates on all the vacant lands, on land holdings, which would be across those 40. Uh, we could then, and that could then provide, like I said, a disincentive for those and recognize the cost of the surrounding infrastructure that has to be increased before there's a vacant land there. Another option is to amend the rating policy to actually have to define the long-term vacant land. I think it's a bit silent uh, in our current rate, uh, rate policy. So we can actually define what that actually means and then utilize, it's almost sort of like a reverse rate, uh, a reverse rebate. So those that actually are developing on vacant land, they get a rate relief versus those that aren't um, uh, building on their vacant land. And then finally, something for council to consider uh, for our is discounts uh, for those ratepayers that do want to actually pay their full rates uh, in advance for the year. Uh, there are other councils that do do that uh, in in Metro Metro Adelaide. Um, typically, it's about one percent discount uh, is is sort of the average across those metro councils. So if we were to consider a 1% discount for those ratepayers that you want to pay up the full one up front for residential, so this is sort of the, the land use code, so residentials would see about a, a, almost a $17 savings uh, in their annual rates if we apply a 1% discount uh, and then yeah, it goes up from there. So happy to take any questions and get your feedback uh, on those uh, other questions. Um, yeah, thank you, Jenny. I was just about to say. Yeah. All right. I should have added it to the bottom. Sorry. <laughs> Members, over to you. Very good presentation. Questions are asked. We'll do questions briefly and then we can go into general feedback. No. Um, I just I just have a quick question for clarity. Um, is, are there any, what sort of limitations are there, I guess, legally around differential rates? You talk about defining positive. Can we, if someone has an unkempt garden, can we have a differential rate for those people? <laughs> what, are, what are the boundaries? What are the boundaries? So, um, through the chair under the Act, there are actually nine separate land use codes that we could apply. Um, but typically we only um, rate on two, being residential and non-residential, which is um, land use codes 239. But there's nothing to stop us having nine separate rates or separate differential rates for each land use code. Right. And, and what sort of land use codes are they? Or were they on there, sorry? Yeah, sorry, I'll just flick through. <coughs> sorry. I'll... There. Sorry, this one? It, so it's there, we've got residential right. office shops, other industry, vacant land. The one that doesn't appear there is primary industry, but obviously in the capital city, we don't have primary land. Okay, understood. Yep. <laughs> okay, that was my question. Easy. Uh, over to you members for general feedback and answering of the prompting questions. Formal question. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, the 1% rate discount, what is the, based on either having done that before or other capital cities looking at or other councils that do it, what's the anticipated, of course you get the money up front but you lose some of it, what's the cost benefit? So the idea is that by getting people to pay their rates up front, yep. we will save costs on obviously managing a rate payers account, we won't have to send them rate notices. We don't and is there any anticipated up. rough guesstimate of what that would add up to based uh, on? No, I'd have to, we have to work that out. And I suppose in, in that same vein, um, you could also consider discounts for people who are on a direct debit sort of arrangement, I suppose, because we do do that, don't we? Yes, we do have direct debit arrangements. Yeah, but, not discount. but, but there's no discounts on any of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, no, no, please. Okay, feedback, please. Come on. Sure, I'll be um, I guess I'll just go through those questions. Let's start from the right. 1% um, discount to encourage the early payment of rates of full, yes. Um, um, I'll, be, I'll be supportive of that. Um, 
decreasing the right into the dollar on vacant land. Um, yes, let's get more development happening because hopefully that will uh, encourage uh, not only more economic stimulus here in the city, but um, uh, maybe that will encourage uh, 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 or I guess increase our um, uh, residential base here in the city. Um, a question on these separate rates. Is there any way to look at that slightly differently rather than looking at it at a, as, a, as a rate? Um, under current legislation, are we able to look at that as a, as a bond, council bond, so that people can actually not necessarily give us rates, but give us an investment. An investment we'll yeah. go and build the infrastructure, whatever it might be, playground, store, whatever, whatever it is, and have some sort of return. It might be monetary, it might not be. Yeah. yeah. Happy to take that on notice and I'm happy to get some legal thinking yeah. around that, but it's an interesting idea. I know um, the US does that quite a bit in their councils, but I'm not sure if that actually applies, if that does work in Australia or yeah. not. But happy to get some advice and come back to you on that. Well, the last bank that people own in South Australia would go great. And I guess that last question I'm not really a, a fan of special discretionary rebates. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see what, what the rest of the room has, uh, has to say and I might come back and give you some more feedback. Okay. Members? Oh, sorry, I had a hand and then... Uh, so yes, could I just ask you quickly before I think about what is a special discretionary rebate again? Yeah, uh, through the chair. So um, what that is, is so we apply... Um, the, the, sorry, it's, it's to ensure that the, the general valuations uh, as a whole doesn't increase by more than 10% on the valuation. So In, for individual property. Yeah. No, no. Oh, so the, the whole thing. Sorry. So the, um, when you get your rates each year, if it's gone up by more than 10% on what you paid last year, then we will oh, rebate it flat. flat. So the flat. most you will ever pay is 10%. Okay. Um, can I go for the uh, quick key questions? Um, I think we should do the 1% because after all those people are foregoing interest um, and we are getting their interest um, and everybody else does that. So it's an easy one. Now, for years at these budget things, we've ignored the Crown Law advice on question number three, that rates and taxes cannot be punitively levied. Um, and that's why we've never done it. And it seems to just be glossed over every time. So the only way we can actually punish people not developing their land is by rewarding those who do develop their land. But I think that, that if that Crown advice is obsolete now, could we go back and ask that? Because we were definitely told that when we tried to rate macros out of existence, that it is not, it's not a subjective thing. A rate or a tax is something you pay because you get something back. Yeah. Now, vacant land actually doesn't cost us anything. So to say that you have to pay double rates for anybody else, is illegal. Mm. Um, so I would agree with um, increasing, uh, giving a uh, discount to people that are developing their land yep. because you can't do the other. Mm -hmm. um, is it introduced? Absolutely not. Um, it is the rates that we charge are for those projects. Now, if we've run ourselves into the ditch, then it's not the ratepayers' job to bail us out. Um, number, uh, keep it at 10%. Sorry, can I just clarify, do you want 10% across the board or just for residential owner occupiers? Oh, across the board. So that's unchanged. Unchanged, unchanged. unchanged. yeah. yeah. It's, worked, it's worked fine now. Um, we brought in the, um, the valuation method of rental value rather than capital value because if we went back to capital, it created too many peaks. Mm -hmm. But we're still sometimes getting peaks here. So it, I don't think it's going to be enormously revenue changing if we keep to the status quo. Mm -hmm. well, through the Chair, just for the benefit, the benefit of those members who may not know that by applying a 10%, um, by applying 10%, what that means in effect is those people that have had a valuation increase don't pay the rates that are due. So that rate burden is redistributed amongst all the other rate payers. So, does that make sense to you? So in other words, and if your if your property went up in value and you were due to pay more than 10% increase, 
by not paying it for 10%, everyone else here pays more. It's well, an interesting concept. And I know it's based that on is, it's that based is a viewpoint that the CEO has put forward, but in actual fact, uh, to present the fact that somebody's massively increased the value of their property and we poor people all have to pay his rates is just not true. Um, the practical outcome is that some properties fall into the next category and they can go up artificially with absolutely nothing changed to that property. And that 10% or 15%, I'm not particularly fast if it went to 15%, but that is necessary. And to, to identify it as something where rich people get their rates paid by other people is absolutely um, not my understanding at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, can can I can I just get some clarity on that? So so is it is it is it is it the case that if my if my if I'm meant to be paying 17% more in my council rates as a result of this measure, which by the way it's the fourth time I've had that question, we re need to rename this so people actually know what it is. Um, by a result of this measure, I'm only paying 10% more than what I paid last year. That extra 7%. Is the CEO, are you suggesting that that's paid by others or are you suggesting that it's just unpaid and the general rate per, um, that's, so that was my understanding. Sorry, okay. Right. There's, not a, there's yeah. not a rate uh, figure that so we have to get. It's more philosophically yeah. the burden is well, spread out, not, not pecuniarily. Yeah, that's right. Right, okay. Because yeah, it, it does, sorry, through the chair, it does represent rates all gone. Yeah, rates rates all gone, gone, yes. but not yeah. rates charged to other people. No, we don't, we don't take that no. gap and then charge it to everyone else, no. And yes, as feedback, we definitely need to rename that measure. Rename. It's very vague. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandy? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, the, uh, that 1% discount was about $98,000 based on what the slide was that we had there. So um, I do uh, support the encouragement of um, paying up front of uh, early payment by introducing 1% discount. Um, I think that if there is a possibility, and, um, and, and, like, and I've heard many of those discussions as to why we can't introduce a differential on, on vacant land, but if we can amend the rating policy to to a definition of long term, and then we can discuss what we consider long term, and it might be more than five years. So, you know, not not wedded to the five year thing. But if there is long term vacant land, um, then I'd be really interested in seeing how we are able to do this, given all the previous discussions said what that we can't. So, um, so I would be uh, interested in looking at that. Um, I think the other side is. Um, you showed us the slide as to how you are rating developments um, and I'm keen to understand how we can assist the development of land by perhaps not rating the end value of something while someone is in construction. So you're, vacant, you're still rating the vacant land, so that slide's mm -hmm. not up, but you gave us a million dollars in terms of vacant land, 800 is the end value and it's 50% complete, but they're actually not getting any income from that 50%. So therefore, to me, I think that what we should do as an incentive to the development is not rate the, until it's completed and they're able to then get tenants or whatever they're doing because they're paying rates on something that's in construction. And they, so they've got no uplift in their value. Um, and at that point, they're still forking out for their development uh, as opposed to once they get to the end of the development, then they pay full rates. So, and there may be something in, in there that for us would be, I think, an incentive for developers to develop. And if we can reduce the holding costs of those developments, um, that also goes to a whole lot of the things that we're trying to do around social and affordable housing, because if we can reduce the holding costs while they're developing, there's more incentive for them to develop, full stop. And that was one of the discussions we had um, even previously when we were looking at rate rebates or whatever we might do around trying to look at affordable and social housing. So I'd like that to talk to that policy if possible. Um, the introducing of separate rates to fund projects of activities, I, I know that has been introduced. I think we need to be very, very careful and specific as to what project or activity that was introduced for, noting that, of course, we collect the uh, our main levy, but we 
for the state government, but we, that levy is not being used back on to the city. So um, it would be a different point of view, given that we also spend 23, 24, 25 million dollars a year on parklands, that that green levy isn't going back into uh, waste or green. Um, I, be, I think we'd need to be very specific as to what that's for, and it would have to benefit all ratepayers of the city if we were going to do it. I don't think we can do things that are um, necessarily isolated um, like that. And in terms of the discretionary rate, I, I agree, keep it at 10%. For both, for both yeah. um, I might just pick up on, on what Sandy said and that. I completely agree with that um, regarding, sorry, the uh, development side. Um, rating policy, because I think on, on the one hand we explain that the whole principle is that um, you're getting X value off your property, but um, that policy is really a contravention of that principle. So if you're saying that's the principle upon which you're rating, um, then that doesn't make sense. But I also just want to highlight that I am really concerned about the state of uh, noting as well that if we keep our rate of the dollar the same, um, there may be, and that where we're where we are relying on having more rateable properties within the city of Adelaide, we're relying on growth and development, and there will be a point of con at which that is unsustainable. But in the meantime, I'm really worried about um, commercial development um, and potentially a lack of commercial development in the future. So anything we can do to decrease those holding costs, um, and I, I probably wouldn't have suggested getting rid of it entirely. I would have just suggested. Do your calculations, but then just delay the introduction of it by 12 months or something like that, um, uh, so that so that they're not getting that hit up front, or, uh, and so that they are actually getting some time in there. So um, I think per per the motion, I ask for that part of the policy to come back in December. So I'll leave that feedback with you and um, see what comes back. Um, I've got yes, just one more in terms of um, our ability to investigate the exemptions that are no longer fair and reasonable. Yeah. Um, universities are big businesses um, and I don't understand why there's an exemption, even if there was a, uh, a discretionary rate in terms of um, them not paying 100%, but certainly I don't think they should have 100% of no rates. Um, and I think we've got several examples right now in the city where they are properties that have been used for commercial use, um, including the plaza, including lot 14, mm -hmm. that that exemption should no longer apply. So um, if that was a hospital, it's no longer a hospital. There may be parts of that mm -hmm. that um, are a university or um, are used for education, etc or the uh, things like the um, cultural centre, mm -hmm. but there are big parts of that and uh, and the festival plaza is a classic example that it is purely for commercial outcome. Mm -hmm. And that was again top of my list. We need to define and test what, what is the public purpose? How, you know, because it's, it's not, if it's a commercial purpose, it's not a public purpose, um, plain and simple. Yes, Parliament House, the People's House, yes, public purpose. Train station, yes, public purpose. Um, but but th there are other such things which which really can't be. And you know, I, given given the businesses that are moving into lot fourteen, I, I I highly highly doubt that they're moving in there and taking up that space free of charge. Um, uh, and universities broadly public purpose, but they're they're still multi multi million dollar corporations effectively. Um, publicly owned, but still corporations. So there are also properties that have been bought by the university that aren't the currently creek. being used for education mm. purposes, mm. which I think should also fall under that. Yeah, way. and so for example, like I saw in the in the slide pack, it seemed like the Masonic Lodge was was uh, exempt, um, but in, in actual fact, that, and this may not be the case, but there, there are only parts of that property that the University of Adelaide uses. So what about? What about the rest of it? And it's the same thing. And I do have an in principle issue with us actually arguing that we should be charging rates for the use of parklands. But that's another matter entirely. The fact is that it's, it's not, not a public purpose and we need to define um, or redefine what, what that actually means. Sorry, I'll just clarify just with the, the universities. It's actually in the each of the university acts. So there's a Uni of Adelaide Act, uh, there's a Flinders University Act and UniSA Act, and the actual Act states that uh, the university uh, is exempt from taxes. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in oh, it is, sorry, it's a different test. Yeah, so, uh, but 
and a lot of um, uh, each of the states, Victoria, New South Wales, and us are challenging that through the LGA uh, around that. So it, I think the Victorian government is actually supposed to come back pretty soon or in the next couple of months with their uh, response on that. So that might then help us feed into the into the SA process as well. But just for the university, there's it's actually the act that actually states that it's exempt from taxes, whereas the other exemptions um, that are worried, majority of those other exemptions are actually in the local government act as well. Um, and we are applying those rebates at those levels. Mm -hmm. Mary? I just want to reiterate, um, the Victorian government has been very Sorry. Um, it, we should really review the exemptions and we think we're all agreed on that and that's mm -hmm. something like lot 14 and all of those um, and what buildings are being used. So that I agree with that. Um, also, I, of course, agree with the 1% discount, you know, maybe a bit more to encourage that, <laughs> but okay, it's 1%. Um, I also do agree that uh, the vacant lands should be uh, rated differently. Um, I think that we should encourage development. Then on the flip side of that, I think that we should also look at the rate relief yeah. as we talked about in the development. Absolutely agree with all of that. Um, I mean, the other um, the other issue in regards to the separate rate consideration in regards to any projects that we do, I would like to see that modelled a bit more. I would I would like to have a look at that and what that would look like and because um, I do have um, rate payers that do talk about that they're prepared to pay more if it means a project is going to get done. Um, and um, but you know I would like to have that further investigated. Now, of course, that comes in uh, discussing the aquatic centre and all and all of that because this is a very valued um, item in the community and they want to see it continually there. Everyone does. So, you know, if that's what we're talking about, sure, happy to look at that, but I want to see what that's what that looks like Um you know, um in, what was the other questions? I mean, yeah, Special. I think that's pretty much all of all that. Discretion rebate, I don't know. I mean everyone's talking about ten percent. I don't I wouldn't mind seeing that a little bit fine maybe, but about ten percent's fine. But yeah. I mean, other than that, I think everyone's agreeing that that's um, pretty much um, what we're we'll looking at. Um, I'll keep it short. Special discretionary rebate, ten percent. Yes, definitely. Both uh, commercial and residential. Um, I agree with the Lord Mayor entirely on separate rates. Um, softly, softly on that. Um, uh, vacant land, I agree entirely with the Lord Mayor. Um, we need to incentivise people. Mm -hmm. uh, and in respect of discounts, um, if you are to apply a discount, I think it should be as a percentage of whatever the Commonwealth Bank cash rate is. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's 1% today, it may be absolutely irrelevant in two years when interest rates move. Mm -hmm. So it should be a percentage of cash rate. Potentially that's something that's approved when the rates Mm -hmm. and are actually set each year, I guess. Yeah. Yes, except interest rates, as we know, can move very rapidly. Yes, but it, uh, look, there's an opportunity for it to change in the policy sense. Uh, Helen and France. Thank you. Um, I'd be happy with 15%. I think that's still within a reasonable bracket. Um, the separate rates to fund projects, activities, I just think that would be way too murky. I don't know how you could possibly look at doing that in a reasonable way, particularly given prior investment to this point in the different wards, which is by no means remotely equitable. And I think that would create a lot of issues. Um, increasing the rate in the dollar on vacant land to encourage if it's possible, if it's legal. Uh, the 1%, I'm not sure, Sandy, what you meant by the 98. It was 98,000 because it was. Oh, one, of course, one yeah, percent. I yeah, think everyone can do that calculation. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> the, uh, the the point I was making is what's what's the what's the savings? So yes, the one percent is easy to determine, but what's the savings if we were to do that based on the administrative cost, etc.? And I would be thinking more if it's one percent. Um, looking at what others seem to do in terms of electricity or gas, seem to look at five percent, and I presume that's based on some sort of economic theory that says it's only if it's a significant 
um, discount that people will bother to do it. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to see what's the what's that magic point, and if there's anyone, I presume other councils or areas have done that research and we could apply that if it's beneficial in this situation. Yes. Um, so I suppose just to keep it light a little bit, yes, 10% uh, both. Um, again, uh, with, with Mary, just have a look at how do you look at these sort of special uh, separate uh, rates. But it, I wouldn't necessarily go by a specific area. It is about, uh, it has to be a, a general uh, community benefit or a city benefit, and because that way you hold it low enough if there's going to be any work that way. And it's just to just to make sure we actually ask them all the questions we can. Um, again, what do you want to encourage uh, development so the vacant land? Um, you know, it, it's basically you're not getting any benefit out of it until it's actually being able to be let. So, if that makes a difference, I'm intrigued. Uh, you know, if it does, because some buildings will take you know, two or three years. Um, uh, so, what? Why would that be an incentive? I'm just intrigued uh, for the you know because again. Uh, you're not getting any value out of it. And 1% discount. Uh, so, well, I mean, it's basically that you're giving a benefit for people paying up front, so long as, uh, you know, it, as long as your savings are certainly great, you know, quietly bigger than that, because, I mean, there's a lot of administration costs and all of this. So, uh, you know, I mean, the whole objective is, is that you're going to get a benefit because we can borrow 1.5% one, one at the minute. Um, so if you're going to save more than that, that's quite right. Members? No, I might just, um, uh, I'll answer the questions in the first instance. Um, I think with the special discretionary rebate, um, I actually think, I'm going to depart from the consensus here and suggest that it actually needs to be means tested. Um, because I appreciate, you know, it's it's to avoid bill shock. Essentially, you're looking to avoid bill shock, and that's and that's fair enough. But for people that can afford it, if they're sitting on a property property that has been massively, uh, well, has been valued, revalued, and gone up substantially, um, I mean, look, a lot of people know what the value of their property is, and they don't come to us because so they don't want us to revalue it. Um, uh, but I, but I think, and so it's fair enough to avoid bill shock. Um, that's good, but let, I think perhaps means testing it. Now, how it's it's far easier. I'm conscious it's far easier to means test a citizen, a taxpaying citizen, or not a taxpaying citizen, than it is to means test a business. Um, so potentially you might not want to touch that part of the policy, or it may be too convoluted. Um, uh, but certainly, on, as a general principle, I think if, if people can afford to pay and they have an increased asset, they should be paying. Um, that's what I think about that. Uh, but as Helen said, it would be nice to get some data and some modelling um, on, on how that how that actually uh, may work um, in practice. But uh, moreover as well, and as well on the, the 1%, um, I generally agree with that. I think that's a, that's a good idea. I think you could also do it with um, direct debit arrangements, because that way you can be confident in cash flow. But potentially you could you could have it, you know, in the last payment of the financial year, or, or, or something like that. Once you've got all the payments that have come through, discount at the end, um, uh, just because you're not you're not getting your quarterly, or you're not getting your twelve monthly cash flow straight up. Um, uh, regarding things such as uh, charging for particular purposes, I'm not in principle opposed to that. And generally speaking, I don't mind. It, the, in principle, a user pay system. However, if you did it, you would actually you, you would need to redesign your entire your entire system. You, I think if you, if you did it, it's it's perhaps worthy of consideration, um, if not now then in future. But you should actually drop your rate substantially, and then and then have a number of different uh, kinds of uh, purposes that you're charging people for, and that could actually, in an equity sense. It'd be a very, very big thing to do, but in an equity sense, you could actually carve out um, things that residents pay for that businesses use and things that businesses pay for that residents use. Um, uh, it, it would be very difficult. I don't recommend undertaking it now, but I would say that only only consider it if you're, you're considering, if you're going to put forward a radical rethink um, of what we're doing. 
um, and that would that would mean and you wouldn't just you wouldn't just do it on the southwest community center you would actually group the whole community portfolio together and say okay this is what you know this is what this is what it costs and so this is what you're paying for when you when you when you give us um, the money and then and then your far reduced rate in the dollar would actually be funding I suppose just your corporate services but um, that's probably not something we want to wade into uh, right now vacant land yes um, absolutely um, we we should be I think if you if you can afford we're talking about holding costs earlier for people that are doing the right thing developing their land you know trying to see progress and at the same time making investment of course but um, if you can afford the holding costs to have something sitting there for, for that length of time and I'm thinking I don't want to single people out but or, or organizations but I'm thinking Sturt Street I'm thinking Guja Street uh, I, I would be thinking um, 88 O'Connell, you know, if you've got the ability to, to have that and bear those holding costs for such a substantial period of time, um, uh, then, then you've got the ability to pay to pay a bit more. And, and in acknowledging that there is there is a huge opportunity cost for us, because that's, I mean, yes, it's less rates in, the, in one sense, but it's also it's less owner occupiers, it's less renters, it's less members of the community, it's less um, space that can be activated. Um, it's 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 just it's just a, a scar on the landscape of the city of Adelaide. We can't. I mean, the entire reason the city was planned the way that it was with the parklands was so you would see a lot of growth and a lot of activity in in the square mile and in the dormitory suburb of North Adelaide. So it, we can't have vacant land sitting in the city for substantial periods of time like that. Um, so anything that can avoid that is good. Um, and that's everything from me. Thank you, members. Were there any further questions or uh, contributions? Well, the start was, look, I think it's been a very, very valuable session. I think everyone's contributions and particularly from the audit committee earlier um, shows that. Thank you, Anne. Uh, so thank you, Sanjoy, Liz and Teresa. And to Claire, pulling that together. Yes. All right, and uh, so we'll move on to three two, the uh, setting the scene uh, for next year's business plan and budget. And if I recall correctly, this was part of some recommendations from the audit committee that we start considering subsequent business plans a little bit earlier in the cycle. Uh, so just to be clear, for many years we did always consider our uh, council around or remember consider our business plan and budget under um, earlier iterations in November with um, council endorsing the um, financial plan assumptions um, and parameters to build um, the subsequent business plan and budget to give the writing instructions to administration for the January February work so that we could come to you in February um, with some more um, robust and um, uh, uh, more robust um, projects and uh, funding requirements. Um, I was going to do a bit of a recap, but um, I think um, the independent members and Mark have both made it quite sort of clear around why we're here tonight. Um, a lot of this information, of course, is publicly available. Um, we um, we have this as part of our um, public um, distribution in terms of rates notices. Um, we've already touched on this before, um, more than ever with COVID, we've um, certainly been impacted by the vulnerability of um, some of our revenue streams. Um, and um, you can see here um, just some data around that. Um, when we look at July last year, we look at our on-street parking, our expiations, U Park Golf Aquatic, um, and then you start to look at um, what was happening in March. Obviously, by July, we were fortunate to see a, a bit of a recovery, but then clearly those two days last week saw um, a real sudden impact. So that shock to the system is real, it does impact our income and it's something that we're um, really mindful of and we're watching really carefully. Um, I really want to hand over to uh, Sanjo and we now have Nicole, thank you for joining us Nicole, um, just to talk through the long-term financial plan. So the assumptions that underpin our current long-term financial plan um, will need to shift and change and that will have an impact obviously on um, our income and our expenditure. So if I just ask uh, Sanjo and Nicole to talk you through uh, what that is. Yeah. 
Thank you, uh, Claire, through the chair. Um, so this slide just covers what our initial uh, assumptions are for the long-term financial plan. So in the um, our current uh, 2021 position, or what we're forecasting to be, is in the debt of $39 million, which will result in a borrowing at the end of 2021 of 92.8, uh, which is around 52% of our uh, capacity in our credential limits. Um, that, that's really, uh, and then for 2021, uh, we are looking to be at $4.7 million in deficits. Um, and then our borrowings, it looks like it goes down that we're paying off the deficit, but it's actually the way we're cash, uh, managing our um, uh, the, uh, cash and non-cash elements uh, in, our, in, in our books at the moment. So that's why it looks like that. But really, the the assumptions that we made, it was really around uh, an improvement in our fees and charges uh, that we want to recover from, from COVID. Uh, and the assumptions we put into the 2021 is around an 85%, uh, recovery up to 85% level of what was pre-COVID. Um, we also looked through uh, in that, it also takes into account the $20 million in operational savings, uh, as well as that $14.4 million in transition costs. So that's incorporated in there as well. And, uh, and a reduction in grant funding of about 2.4. So that's taken into account in the current positions uh, in the long-term financial plan. Sorry, it's a bit clear. Um, sorry, yeah, so if you look at what, if we, you know, now that we, what we know now versus what we knew back then when the initial long-term financial plan was adopted, things have changed. Uh, and we've got more information from the market around things like inflation, interest, interest rates, and you know, further insights around what are growth in new development. So that's the growth in, uh, in rates income. So looking at what we're, what we're, I guess, forecasting in the 21-22 year is really an inflation of around 2%. Uh, uh, interest rates would be around that 2% mark is what we're kind of estimating. And really the thing that's, that we need to really be mindful of is that we're only really projecting around uh, rates growth in new from new developments of only around 1%, where historically over the, few, over the years, if you look at uh, our rates income increases, uh, which is around 3%, which was a combination of valuation uplift and uh, new development. So new development on roughly is around the 1.2 to 1.5, and 1.5 is around valuation increase. So that's usually around where you get that 3%. Uh, uh, in, in our long-term plans, but we're actually looking at going forward that that growth will actually go down. And that's one of the volatilities that we have around looking at rate income through new developments. And so that's something just to be mindful of. Um, then we go through, um, uh, sorry. Uh, so then we have to look at some of the positions we're gonna end up being around uh, 2021, which is uh, deficit of 4.7. Uh, we have forecasting what our 30-31 position is going to look like, which is going to be in a surplus of about 6.7 million, but our borrowings uh, is going to be around the 165 million mark, which is around 78% of our prudential limit. So you were really at that upper limit where our capacity to, uh, as David mentioned, our capacity to handle th other things that come through is going to be quite limited. So there's real challenges in there. Um, so once again, so what we're looking at um, is what, what we're revising some of our long-term financial plans around um, the interest rates between that 1.3 to 2%, inflation, uh, which is around that 1.25 to 2. So we're just modeling some of that at the moment. Uh, and really the impact around that is, is ending up being a, a revised debt position at the end of the long-term financial plans around $194 million, which is at 87%. Our prudential limit. If we don't, if we don't consider something, um, that does the assumption of that one A four takes into account that no new or significant upgrades is happening other than the central market arcade, uh, and that council will be will still continue to borrow to fund asset renewals from uh, in 2020, 2028 to twenty twenty thirty. Um, based on those debt levels, uh, our there is limited capacity for us to deal with emerging priorities. And the, the overall debt, if we look at how we get our, our surplus and how we pay down our debt, you're looking at being able to pay down our full debt 
by 2050 to 2051. So you can see, you can see that there's actually a significant legacy that we are leaving behind uh, for future generations to, to deal with if we, if we don't do something. So what do we look at? So what are some what are the levers that, that we we've got? Obviously we've got some uh, we've got rates uh, in there, and you know, if we look at rates growth of two point five to three percent uh, from twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three, which is what we put in, and that could be done either through a combination of uh, new developments, increased valuations, or an increased rate on the dollars. That's the option we've got, but we'd be looking at something around there. Um, you know, really it's done around projects uh, and services. Really, it's around we've got an increase through CPI that we're going to have uh, for projects. Obviously, we've also taken into account um, from a projects and renewals perspective of a reduced budget. So going forward, we are looking at reducing our uh, asset renewals down to twenty five million. Uh, 20 million, sorry, uh, in, in renewals. Um, and then obviously we've got our fees and charges in, in there as well. We actually look at some of the scenarios, uh, funding scenarios. I think this is really uh, where we think through around what the three options and you, you'd hear from Ross around that we, or so David and Ross in the uh, external audit around we should be considering a surplus or a break even. So this is the scenarios around how we could achieve a break even or, or a surplus, surplus position. So if we just, at this stage, just look at the rates elements, if we do nothing, uh, or if we still continue to freeze rate on the dollar and we hold our valuations, um, we're projected to have new developments around, say 1.24% in, in revenue, which increases our income by $1.5 million. If we look at what a break-even scenario look like, could look like, and the break-even would be basically a, a surplus position, not a deficit position at the end of the year. Uh, we'd look, be looking at an a, a increase to residential rates by about $50 a year, and then $100 increase to non-residential per year, oh, sorry, for, for the year. We'd still continue to hold overall valuations, and new developments will still stand about 1.24%. So that it results in an increase of income by $3.3 million. If we were to then look at what a surplus could look like, we would then be looking at $100 increase to residential per year and uh, for the year, and then $200, sorry, uh, for the non-residentials and everything else they said. That would generate about $5.1 million in income. If we then look at fees and charges, if we look at a freeze, so we'd still continue to freeze uh, fees and charges as we've done this financial year, uh, we'd still be looking at only achieving about 85% of our income through uh, based on the pre-COVID levels. Uh, basically, there's be no impact or no increase to our income from fees and charges. Through the break-even scenario, if we increase fees and charges by 5% and we still hold our assumptions around what the uh, at, at the 85% level of pre-COVID levels, we're looking at about a half a million dollars increase, and then obviously in a surplus, we're looking at close to a million dollars if we increase fees and charges by 7.5%. Once again, infrastructure, we're really looking at holding uh, our infrastructure uh, at $20 million. Uh, that does re result in having our sustainability ratio at about 67%. Um, and we still uh, no new or significant upgrades are being proposed. Obviously, as um, uh, Mark mentioned, we are coming back in February to talk through the strategic asset management plans, and that'll actually give you the, the real detail on what that actually looks like. And we have taken into account things like the bridge, the weir as well, So, but we'll talk, come back in February with that as well. So what does that look like? So if you package all of that together, um, and you look at the freeze break even the surplus. So at the end, if you look at the freeze elements and taking into account all those levers and we holding on everything, we are forecasting to be in a deficit for 21-22 of $6.9 million. And our borrowings will be at 52% of our prudential limits at, at 92 million. By 30-31, we would be at a deficit of 0.1 million, $100,000 but our borrowings would be up to 96%, $215 million. 
if we look at break even for starting from 2020, 21, 22, sorry, um, we'd be in a surplus of $300,000. Borrowings of 84, but by 30, 31, our position would be in a surplus of 9.2 million. And our borrowings would be at like 137, so 61%. So it's still fairly high, uh, even with the break even element. We look at the surplus, which once again, pick, uh, recap, $100 increase to residentials, $200, $200 increase to non-residentials. Uh, we still hold valuation, still uh, have new developments at 1.24%. Fees and charges by 7.5%. Uh, our infrastructure and assets are per the long-term financial plan, and SAMPA comes through with a ratio of 67%, which is about $20, uh, $20 million. Uh, reduction in strategic project expenditure by 1.3 million, uh, so it'd be down to about 5.4 as a once off in 21-22, and then a reduction in services by 5.2 million dollars, and that's something we'll come back again in the new year to talk to you about our uh, about our services as well. Um, that then brings us at the end of that, in, in, by the end of 21-22, we become uh, in a surplus by 4.3 million dollars. Our borrowings are at $80 million, but by 3031, uh, we'll be in a surplus by $15 million. Our borrowings are at about $90 million, which is about 40% of our prudential limit. And that actually does down give us some capacity to deal with things that come, can come through that we may not be aware of, but or if there are other things that we council may want to consider. So that's in a very quick snapshot, the, the three scenarios. Happy to take any kind of questions. So I want to take it. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, thanks, Chair, and through you, um, Sunjoy uh, or, or Claire or anybody else, in the projections about the no change but increase in rate dollars earned because of approved developments coming on stream and becoming renewable yeah. entities, um, is that is that calculation the actual dollars or the actual dollars net of the costs of servicing those rateable entities? Sorry, just to clarify. So in the rates income, we're projecting to increase our rates income by 1.24%, which is based on the new development. So the new building, new, and that is so that, that's income. Correct. Uh, what I'm interested in is the cost of servicing, servicing those, those additional yeah. multiple entities. Yeah, they're not they're, they're not incorporated into that. No, they're not. No. So therefore, in net impact, it's actually considerably less than that. Yes. I, I would suggest it's, that's occurred to me myself as well. I would suggest that there must be some sort of formula that you can have to understand if you're bringing on if 1.24 percent is x amount of residents you know what what is the cost of servicing that in, you know, potentially in a waste yeah. sense or what have you yeah. Well, yeah. 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 just understand Sorry, just to add through the chair, though that 1.24% is based on 11 new developments, so it's only 11 new developments, it could be a mixture of brand new or it could be alterations to existing properties, and so therefore that might not necessarily incur additional costs. It'd be interesting yeah, and helpful yeah, makes, to, to yeah. understand that, that uh, in a net sense, estimated net sense. Sorry, does that include revaluations then, the 1.24%? No. no, that isn't just purely up, it's through new development, it's yeah. a evaluation to bring how it is. Okay. Cool. Questions or commentary for us? Um, uh, in, you know, you guys, have you worked on any where there potentially is a decrease in the value of, uh, you know, of the Properties, etc. To put that in, you know, saying that you know you're going to have X number of empty shops. Forgetting your turnover, obviously, is less. Mm -hmm. uh, you've now got uh, uh, you know, properties that are going to be vacant, and you know, some sort of decrease over time. Yeah, through the chair, we in the long-term financial plan, we haven't considered at this stage if the overall valuations would decrease because of the market conditions through COVID. So that's one of the things we haven't done at this stage, but it is something that we would want to model. 
Um, if I could just add through the chair, um, we've been working um, really closely um, externally to make sure that um, we're across what uh, valuations are looking like. So we're getting regular um, information either through value general or through other means to make sure we are keeping an eye. So if there was a sudden hit to the property market within, within the CBD, um, that we're um, making sure that we're modeling that ahead of time. So if it's a 5%, 10% drop, what does that look like? Um, that, that's work that's certainly um, being considered. So are you collecting feedback on this, Sandra, or I mean, you've, there's no key questions where you just present those scenarios. Mm -hmm. Do you want feedback? Or? No. No. We'll have many, many sessions on this budget, I'm sure. But just a, can, yeah, yeah. Look, um, I um, I heard what the CEO said about how um, let's not have a political discussion. Um, that this is too serious, that we actually all need to sit down and have somehow an a political debate. And I will go easy, I will, but I just, I, I do want to remind everyone that it is a political discussion and it has to be, because the council is in financial strife where its predecessor was not, and the way out of it well, no, it, it was the case, Sandy. Yeah, the last year of Hazy's um, the term was not good. The previous years were okay. So we are, we are, uh, as a consequence of the last few years, in financial strife. And in order to extricate the city from that strife, the consequences are um, to do nothing, which is clearly going to be disastrous, or to do something. And as a result of that, we will ask ratepayers to pay more in their rates. We will ask ratepayers to pay more in fees and charges. And according to that chart, we will ask them to accept fewer services. Um, it is a giant belt in the face um, that it is going to be hard for them to ignore. And so there has to be a political discussion and it's impossible to avoid. Um, now, I, I would like to ask, in, in what is going to be from time to time a very heated discussion, that we also have some more information in addition to the levers that have been presented to us. That's raising, uh, raise rates, raise fees and charges, decrease services. Um, I, I would like to hear about how it is we will be more financially, fiscally responsible in the management of our affairs and what savings they will deliver, because that is a very big lever and it is not being discussed in any way that I know in a public forum. Um, so I, I would like to hear that. When I got that information, um, I can make a much more reasoned uh, decision and enter into reasonable discussion about all the other levers. But we've got to have all of the information in front of us. Uh, and financial management is key to that. But, you know, it, it is going to be a very bitter pill for people to swallow, uh, and it does require some pretty deft footwork. Yes. Oh, yes, look, I agree. I, I don't think you want really us to, cut to really put our political feedback at this early stage. We have nearly got enough information on mine is just to freeze it, take a lot of convincing to uh, pass it on to rate payers again. But uh, with all due respect, Chair, I think this is just the you opening know, shot across the bows and we should not be showing or, or making decisions at this early stage. And, and I don't think we are, this is just a committee. No, you're the right. Political chambers mm -hmm. over there. Um, so we'll leave that. Political chambers in here too. Sandy. Um, there is there is one other just to to uh, Phil's point, not not necessarily about the uh, politics, but it's certainly about the levers. Is that um, we have been asking for some time, I guess, a dedicated workshop or a way to look at what our revenue streams are going forward. Um, I would still like us to have that to explore what the potential revenue streams might be. Um, particularly when we're looking at what the long-term scenarios are for parking businesses, for the businesses that we already have. 
Uh, I would like to put on the agenda um, for early in the new year a dedicated uh, workshop with um, around economic development for this council in terms of where we should be investing for return and growth and revenue. Great. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, in, in, one, in a sense, echoing uh, the Lord Mayor's uh, comments, there, um, looking solely at, and I'm not criticising, it's, it's really good information, uh, looking solely at revenue and expenditure um, does, doesn't give us the bigger economic uh, scenario. And of course, you know, if, if any of us knew what the next, you know, what the economy would be like in 12 months time, we'd be rich and probably not sitting here. But um, <laughs> the reality is we are in the early stages uh, of, we don't know for how long uh, the global pandemic recession is going to be impacting us. And we don't at this stage, and I'm not suggesting I've got any you know, magic pudding either um, solution, uh, we don't at this stage know fully what the impact of uh, on asset values, on assessed annual value will be of the scenarios like a, a, a failure to return to pre-COVID mm -hmm. occupancy of commercial buildings, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, in terms of long-term financial planning, the, 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 we, we need some more uh, scenarios mm -hmm. to uh, contemplate and, uh, and uh, you know, it will, those scenarios will uh, uh, challenge us, uh, but challenge us in a way that's in, that's informing rather than, uh, and yes, speculative, but informing rather than um, us just uh, potentially considering only the short term and not the medium or the longer. Yeah. Yeah. So just just um, reiterating that we've got the 85% of pre-COVID levels, which is a, a very sort of reasonable assumption, but it would be good to have scenarios on the side of that so that we can actually see, um, you know, what that might look like if we do go back to 100% of pre-COVID or if we drop back to maybe 70% of pre-COVID, what that looks like and what decisions need to be made. Yeah, we need to be making decisions within a certain tolerance. Yeah, within tolerance, yeah. 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 Um, I might just, yeah, just very, very quickly. Um, oh, France, please. Just, yeah. I mean, um, we've been talking about our long term financial you know, planning, etc. Um, and I, haven't, I don't know if I've, I've missed it. Uh, do we have any sort of indication about, okay, we have these, these poor, uh, you know, uh, maintained, uh, or should I say, you know, assets, etc. Has there been any sort of actual sort of guessing? So here is, we know the bridge is some 70 years out, you know, with that. So that, Besides the, the sort of here it is what we're looking at, uh, you do have at least some feel of, you know, we're starting to look in trouble here, what are we going to do so that you start to to see how, how hard or whatever we're going to try to do to actually, you know, be, be at that point uh, rather than it being relatively linear and then all of a sudden here we got this last you know, large amount. So it is so it is more real when, uh, than we're looking at because I think that helps me to say when, how far do I have to um, be concerned, which is obviously already quite a lot. So through the chair, so I think that will actually come through when we talk through the uh, strategic asset management plan in February because we'll actually then tie in uh, the long term financial plan and then deep dive into the um, asset management. So then you'll actually really be able to see what are the big ticket items that will be coming and when it will be coming. Sorry, Jim, one more question. And that doesn't factor in um, any sort of grants through state or federal government for. As, you know, such as we've been doing around economic um, stimulus packages around some of our assets, major assets. No, no not at okay. this stage, no. So things like the federal government's yeah. matching or the state government matching, yeah, that's not taken into account. Um, just very, very briefly, yeah, the Lord Mayor was right. It's, what, what, what is missing from it is particularly any capital investment in something that generates revenue for us. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but yeah, we need to look at that um, separately. But yes, it is, it is sort of just numbers on a page at this point, and I appreciate that we're at this sort of 
um, early stage in the process. But when you when you when you're wanting to compare things over ten years, I think we need to consider more of the other levers that we have. Um, look, I'm I'm no economist. I've only been doing this for a couple of years, but I would say freeze, spend, grow. Um, that those would be the three key words that I would that I would um, use to guide some policy parameters. But because um, I think you need to you need to you need to grow your revenue. We cannot increase fees and charges or taxes. Um, uh, and but in order to grow your revenue, you're going to have to you're going to have to invest, and you're going to need to invest in things that actually make a return. Mm -hmm. So going back to what the audit committee said about a BCR, because I can tell you, well, I can't tell you, but I would assume if Gold Place had a BCR, never would have been done. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. Well, that's deep. Have a BCR. I'd love to know. I'd love to know what the dollar ratio was. Yeah. But, but expensive projects that actually that you know, thirty million dollars on Victoria Square, almost twenty on on Gawler Place. You know, but what is the actual uplift from it? No, let's actually let's actually spend some money on things that give us a return um, on investment ROI from here. That's what we have to do. Anyway, thank you, Mark. Yeah, just some closing comments, um, members. A solid conversation tonight. I think it's been a really positive one. So. Thank you. We started the night with um, with some good advice from the independent audit committee members. So thank you for coming along for that. Sorry, sorry. Can we just stop having our separate conversations? We nearly did. Oh, okay. Those members that weren't here tonight, I will inform them and provide the information that they've missed out on. Um, I already think this has got an important moment for council and one that requires an adjustment to our eroding um, income and our and our future financial discipline. So it's a very important time for us. Um, talked about those rating policy issues and we talked about our business plan and budget and the funding scenarios and, and the available levers. Um, again, for the public that may be watching this, no decisions have been made. There's been a lot of things talked about, no decisions. Those decisions will happen subsequently as we go through the budget process. So I want to be really clear with that. Um, we'll consider the feedback that's been provided tonight and we will come back to you with a series of, of, of further workshops. So thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That's great. Yeah.